Hi students. Um, so I want to talk about how we can tie together the three works for this week. Persuasion, Mary Wollstonecraft's Vindication of the Rights of Women, and uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning's The Musical a Musical Instrument. And basically what I want to talk about are the feelings that might be uh, registered by women writers in this time period and that are that's, that are similar uh, in these three works and that that is um, those are the, the feelings of um, well number one it, you know women are not supposed to be in the public sphere they're supposed to be in the private sphere according to 18th and 19th century gender ideology in the British nation. And so any woman who ventures into the public sphere to write, to speak uh, publicly, is viewed as possibly a fallen woman. There are connotations of that because she becomes a public woman, for goodness sakes. Um, and so women writers of the time period had to be very careful in their tone, choosing the right tone, choosing the right style, and always um, genuflecting and apologizing for even being in the public sphere, all of which become a kind of code of, uh, that later writers, Victorian writers, will also use. You know, I'm humble. I don't mean to be here. I have to be here because either my husband is a, a wastrel and can't make enough money for us, or my children are starving, or I really have a good cause to talk to you about, etc. There had to be a good rationale for her to write, to become a public woman. So there's, there's one thing. And then uh, an, another element here is that I think all three are also trying to talk about women in a time that says, well, it's really men who should be telling women what, what they should do. And in the Victorian period, it, it becomes the woman question, capital W, W, and capital Q. And it's mainly men who are answering what that question is. And the question is, what are women supposed to be? What are they supposed to do with their lives? What uh, talents and qualities do they have? And so whenever women ventured into this argument, they, had, they, had, they felt, you can tell in the tone of their voices, the tones that they use, that they're much more careful about uh, talking about this question, ironically. And so it's interesting to look at the different tones available in persuasion, in uh, vindication, and in a musical instrument. But in a musical instrument, Elizabeth Barrett Browning is uh, using poetry, and we, we looked at prose uh, with a vindication and persuasion. And poetry has the tendency to show more feeling and more telescoped feeling, more intensities and layers of feeling um, all at once, and can be very overwhelming and overpowering for the reader. And I think this is a, a, a very overpowering, painful poem in so many ways. She's looking at the great mythology, the Greek mythology, and she loved Greek mythology. She could uh, read and write in Greek. She was well versed in the mythologies and in the writing, the great writers. She was aware of this tradition, this history uh, of Western civilization, of course. And she wondered where she fit in, because it was a history of men, his story, basically. Um, and she knew she was a great writer, as did Jane Austen, as did uh, Mary Wollstonecraft. She knew she had a good cause. She knew she had something to say. But where did she fit in if, up until the 19th century, it was men who wrote? Um, how did she fit in? And then she understands what the mythology about the creation of art, where art comes from, means for women. And that is, if Pan takes something from nature, this natural object from nature, and penetrates the reed, cuts holes in it, 
and then makes music from the, that flute. Uh, that is the beginning of all art. And what that means is art is a violation. It is a penetration and it is violence. And I think Elizabeth Barrett Browning recognizes as well that it is a male violence on female nature. And she's trying to figure out, well, if that's how it is, uh, if there's a kind of rape here, and it's, it's very similar to Wordsworth's nutting, uh, where nature is violated, and, and where Wordsworth says, you know, when we walk in nature, we need to be careful, we need to be gentle with nature. And Elizabeth Barrett Browning is saying, well, where's uh, gentleness here? Um, and she's wondering, well, if I'm going to be a writer, am I violent? And it's, it's a beautiful poem. What was he doing, the great god Pan, down in the reeds by the river, spreading ruin and scattering bands, splashing and padding with hoofs of a goat, and breaking the golden lilies afloat with the dragonfly on the river? He tore out a reed, the great god Pan, from the deep, cool bed of the river, the limpid river water turbidly ran, and the broken lilies a dying lay, and the dragonfly had fled away ere he brought it out of the river. High on the shore sat the great god Pan, while turbidly flowed the river, and hacked and hewed as a great god can, with his hard bleak steel at the patient reed, till there was not a sign of the leaf indeed to prove it fresh from the river. He cut it short, did the great god Pan, how tall it stood in the river, then drew the pith like the heart of a man steadily from the outside ring and notched the poor dear dry empty thing in holes as he sat by the river. That is the way, this is the way, laughed the great god Pan, laughed while he sat by the river, the only way since gods began to make sweet music they could succeed. Then, dropping his mouth to a hole in the reed, he blew in power by the river. Sweet, 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 O oh Pan, piercing sweet by the river, blinding sweet, O oh great god Pan, the sun on the hill forgot to die, and the lilies revived, and the dragonfly came back to dream on the river. Yet half a beast is the great god Pan, to laugh as he sits by the river, making a poet out of a man, the true god sigh for the cost in pain, for the reed which grows never more again, as a reed with the reeds in the river. Well, it's, it's a lament. It's, it's so, there's so much pain here from Pan. And Elizabeth Barrett Browning shows that uh, suffering and that rape very well. And yet she has to figure out how she's going to use that reed, that very same reed that Pan has created. Um, and I, I've always been bewildered by this poem, how many layers of, of pain and emotion there are here, because uh, Elizabeth Barry Browning is a very powerful writer, and she knows she's got power. And she likes wielding that power. She likes picking up the pen. And she does seem to be the kind that could commit violence. She wasn't very nice about other women writers. She constantly belittles other women writers. So she knew how to be violent. And she knew this about herself, I think. And um, so at one and the same time, she feels this sense of, yes, I can be just as violent as what happens here with what Pan is doing to nature. But she also seems to be trying to seek out a third way, a different way. Is there only uh, the possibility of women being lip limpid receptacles and of men only being violators, which is a typical uh, metaphor in the 18th, 19th century was that men were the hunters and women were the hunted. Uh, not a very lovely uh, way to view the love relationship. So I'm wondering at all if the tone changes, changes at the end of this poem where she says, sweet, 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 O oh, pen. And she seems to be saying, I have the pen now. Women have the pen now. And if, you, if we can join in the writing of love, 
and of art. Perhaps we can do something about this violence, this penetrative violence taking place and create something sweet instead. Learn how to make sweetness and beauty uh, with nature, not against and upon nature. I, uh, she does say the true gods would not want this, and yet she also seems to realize that Pan is part of the story. So it's, it's, it's not resolved at the end, but she's saying, hey, look, you're going to have to deal with me because I'm going to write and I'm going to be part of the new mythology. In the same way in Persuasion, where we see Wentworth dropping the pen twice and being penetrated by Anne, by her looks and by her words. And in the same way that Mary Wollstonecraft says, sorry, I have to speak. And I won't be stylish, and I'm not going to attend to, <clears throat> you know, every proper word and saying things gently to you so that you can hear them. <clears throat> Excuse me. I am going to say them in my own words. As a passionate woman, uh, she does, you know, I think you notice that she does apologize for herself over and over again, yet at the same time. There's this other layer of feeling, this passion that says, you know, sorry folks, what you see is what you get when you deal with Mary Wilson.